Man. Okay, let's look a quick uh, review statement. I just, the same one that I used the last couple of weeks. It's that the bridegroom message is a call to intimacy with God, just so we get it real clear when we talk about the bridegroom message. Number two, it's more than intimacy, but we're encountering his heart, his emotions, etc. Number three, he wants partnership. He doesn't want us just to feel his presence. He actually wants us engaging in partnership, but he wants it with a spirit of abandonment. That's part of the bridegroom message. It's not just that he's kind and he's generous, but he's abandoned and he wants us abandoned. That's part of understanding the message of being the bride of Christ. Well, I, I'll say that for a few more weeks because I just want you to get those four points. Those are very kind of broad strokes. Paragraph C, yeah, I find this uh, very significant that in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the bridal uh, relationship is mentioned directly four times. Three times by Jesus and once by John the Baptist. But the significant part is that the first four times, and it's all in the Gospels, it's a, it's a focus upon the bridegroom, not the bride. You, you don't hardly hear anything about the bride, just one brief reference by John the Baptist, but it's the bridal relationship from the perspective of who he is as the bridegroom God. And why is that? Because as we see him as the bridegroom, we gain insight into who we are as his cherished bride. And the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, when we see his glory, it changes our emotions. We're transformed. By seeing what he, who he is, we understand who we are. And the reason that's important is that some folks, even in the body of Christ, they're trying to find their identity first and then figure out who he is second. But it's really the other way around. The truth of our identity is actually seen in the truth of his. And we'll never feel like the cherished bride any more than we have insight into him as a passionate bridegroom with deep desire. It's when I see that in him, then I can believe who I am to him. And so I find it's very significant that in the, new, in the Gospels, the bridal relationship is seen through the perspective of the bridegroom specifically. And so, but in the book of Revelation, it's the other way around. The emphasis is on the bride. Now, Jesus' glory is all through the book of Revelation, of course, but he's never called the bridegroom, but the bride and the wife of the bride are mentioned a number of times. But it begins with him saying, I'm the bridegroom, I'm the rock, I'm the foundation of this whole relationship. Okay, let's begin in, in John chapter 2. Jesus' miracle ministry began at a wedding. I mean, that's interesting, is that of all the places where Jesus could have began his ministry, it's at a wedding. And more specifically, there's a bit of mystery to it. Because you know the story in John 2. They're at the wedding. They're out of wine. Jesus' mother says, hey, Jesus, what about? He goes, Mom, not now. I can't do it except for the Father. But somewhere in the next hour or two or three or, I don't know, in a short amount of time, Jesus, he's commissioned from the Father to start his miracle ministry. And so, I, you know, I often wonder, what happened? Mom said, Jesus, he goes, no, Mom, no, I can't go. We're not doing it that way. I really love you, but I'm under his leadership. And I just imagine him going away and saying, Father, Father, I, this bride is walking down the aisle, and my heart is moved because Jesus has been through the temptation. He's anointed by the Spirit, so he's ready to go. He's going, Father, I see her walking down the aisle. What about and this is my own little speculation, somewhere in that, the father says, now. Because he's under the father's leadership, not under his mother's. And so in an hour, or two, or three later, he does it. Or, you know, we don't know the time frame. And so I find that it's, it's, it's interesting that 
His, his ministry to the human race begins in a wedding in the natural, in Cain of Galilee, but it ends in a wedding in the New Jerusalem and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Just like we said last week, Adam and Eve, human history begins in a garden with a bride and a bridegroom, but natural history ends at the marriage supper of the Lamb of the redeemed standing before the Lord. This is not accidental. God the Father is orchestrating this storyline. It's not just about getting escaping hell or being used by God to do tasks for God, that we run errands for God. We were used our hands to do miracles or we're his messengers. Lord, we'll do tasks. He goes, yeah, I want you to do tasks. But that's not mostly what this is about. It's mostly a story about a bride and his eternal companion forever. And the task will only be interpreted in the right light through that lens. And that's what this message of the bridegroom God is all about. Well, we know the story in John chapter two. They're out of wine. And uh, the uh, master of the ceremonies, verse 10, you know, he, the, the servants bring him these, these uh, six big containers full of wine, and it's really good. And the master of the ceremonies of the wedding says, hmm, this is interesting. Every man uh, begins to set out the good wine, and then when the, the uh, guests have drunk the wine, then we give the cheap stuff. Then you give the, 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 the real inferior stuff. But somewhere you've kept the good wine until the last. And that's a, intra I think that that's in itself a prophetic statement. Number one, that Jesus began his ministry at a wedding. That's a prophetic statement but that he saves the best wine until last. Because we find at the end of natural history, right before he comes, that's when the bridegroom revelation is released globally like no other time in history. So several times, which we'll point out in a few moments, we notice Jesus is saving the best wine, the bridegroom revelation, he saves till the last. And so we'll look at that in just a few moments here. Let's look at Roman numeral two. Well, it starts, the, 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 the first actual reference to the Lord in the New Testament as the bridegroom is through the lips of John the Baptist. Now this is about, uh, uh, I mean this is around Passover, AD 27, and uh, Jesus has been anointed. He's gone through the 40 days. That was in the autumn. This is the spring. So it's four, you know, three, four, five, six months later. He's been anointed by the Spirit. He's done the miracles at Cain of Galilee, just a few, you know, just a, right before that. But he still hasn't declared himself. And nobody, he did the miracles and then he slipped away and they go, you know, who, how, what, what happened? So it wasn't really clear his ministry began. He knew it began, but the, it wasn't so public. So now, this is just south of Samaria, a little bit north of Jerusalem, just south of Samaria. John the Baptist is out uh, by a place where there's a lot of water. It says in verse 25, and there's a dispute. And John's disciples are arguing with some of the Jewish leaders. And they're arguing about purification. And what that means is some of the Moses rituals or rites, some of the mosaic rites that they did, the ceremonies, but the real issue is about dedication to God. That's what the purification rites or ceremonies were about, showing your dedication to God. So John's disciples, they're fiery young guys. They're arguing with some of the Jewish authorities, hey, you know, what about being dedicated to God? I mean, we know you know the Moses stuff, but what about really doing this thing? Verse 26, and then they turn to John. John's right there. He hadn't said anything yet in the conversation. And they go, John, there's another problem. These Jewish guys are, met, are missing what dedication is, but there's another problem. There's this preacher. We don't know much about him. His name's Jesus. But all the people are leaving you, John, and they're coming to him. And that concerns us. 
We're concerned that the Pharisees don't know what real dedication is, and we're concerned that the masses don't know how anointed you are. They're going for the new guy. And they said, what, what's the deal? And then John, verse 27, he, make, or he says quite a bit, and we'll look at it at, at, at another session, this passage, because it's very significant, but tonight's just a broad strokes of the New Testament, so we're not gonna go deep on any one passage. He makes this thunderous declaration about this new guy, this new preacher, Jesus. But it's a little cryptic, but it's filled with meaning. Verse 29. Verse 29 is one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. I mean, you get, remember, you get to have about 100 favorite verses, but this is one of them. He makes this cryptic statement about Jesus. He goes, he that has the bride... He is the bridegroom. And these guys are going, okay, that's cool, John. We're not talking about a wedding. There's a, a preacher stealing your crowd. He goes, yeah, yeah, I know. Let me say it again. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. I'm picturing them saying, John, I don't think you understand. Your ministry is diminishing. And he goes, no, let me tell you who I really am. I'm a friend of the bridegroom. I'm not the center story. I'm like the best man at the wedding. My job is to get the bride and the bridegroom focused and in the get the bride in the embrace of the bridegroom. My goal is to get out of the way. I'm not the center story. My young disciples, he could have said, you've got it wrong. My role is to get her focused on him, not upon me. And if I get her understanding him and receiving his embrace, my job is done. That's what I'm here to do. And he said, I rejoice greatly. I'm not depressed because my numbers are going down. Because I have so much joy personally that I've heard his voice. And the voice not just of the Savior or of the King, the voice of the beautiful bridegroom God that delights in me. He goes, I'm and I'm filled with joy that he's on the earth calling the nation to himself, but not just as a savior, not just as a forgiver, which again, that's always a, a glorious and never to be minimized, but he's calling them as a bridegroom. So what's really happened is that both of the issues that these young disciples of John were concerned about are answered in this one statement. They're debating over the best way for dedication and purity. And John says, I'll tell you how. Focus on this man as a bridegroom. That is your best way forward to dedication. And as for the decrease of my profile and my influence, it's the same answer. I'm in the focus of a bridegroom. And as long as he is increasing, it doesn't matter to me what happens. I mean, this is a profound statement which has layers of meaning for even the Lord's leaders today. Well, let's look at paragraph B. He makes the statement, he that has a bride, he is the bridegroom. Now, this is the first declarative, direct statement in the New Testament that Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, is in fact the bridegroom that Hosea and Amos and Jeremiah talked about in the Old Testament. They said he is the bridegroom. So it's not just he is that man, he's that person, but there's something more. And I've said this each session, but I love to say it. He's saying the essence of who he is is a bridegroom. I mentioned that He's a king with power, but he's a bridegroom with desire for relationship, deep desire for relationship. At the essence of his being, he is a bridegroom. He functions like a king, but the essence of his being, he is a bridegroom. That's who he is. When he thinks, when he feels, when he acts, he acts as a bridegroom. He uses his power as king to express his personality as a bridegroom. So he goes, he is a bridegroom. I'm sure 
John's disciples, they're not, they're like, okay, I don't know that you really are tracking with us, John. This guy's stealing all your people. <laughs> he goes, no, I don't think you're tracking with who he is. Then he says another statement that's a, a bit cryptic, but it's very dynamic. He says, he that has the bride. That John, by the spirit of prophecy and revelation, he is saying from, from before the foundations of the world, the Father has ordained that his son would have a prepared bride. Before the foundations of the world, the Father and the Son, it was settled he would be the lamb that was slain. And when the Father and the Son agree in love together, nothing can change it. And that was established before Genesis chapter 1. And so in reality, because Jesus was absolutely sure to finish the task, and the Father would be pleased, the bride would be purchased, John, by the spirit of revelation, he's declaring, in the certainty of sovereignty, and the certainty of victory. He goes, he has the bride. It's already a victory because when the Father and the Son are in this kind of unity, there's no power in hell or on earth can move them from it whatsoever. It's already done because their hearts are set. He has a bridegroom. Now, I, I'm imagining his, his young disciples are going, John, I think we missed you on this one, but we still love you. Paragraph C, D, he identifies himself. He's the first one to use the phrase, the friend or the best man in our terminology. I'm responsible to help the bridegroom, I mean the bride in any way I'm here to serve for her to see him more clearly and to receive him more fully. That's really what the best man role in this terminology is about. But it's the term, friend of the bridegroom. And I believe today the Lord is raising up men and women, messengers, end time messengers, that have the friend of the bridegroom spirit of John the Baptist. That is, John the Baptist was a forerunner declaring the first coming, preparing people to understand him at the first coming. I believe the Lord will have multitudes of messengers preparing the nations, the people that they're, you know, they're connected to in their part of the world, to receive the second coming of Jesus, the bridegroom king, and they'll be operating in the friend of the bridegroom spirit. And this spirit, it has a specific message. He's not just a king with power, but he's coming as a bridegroom filled with love, filled with desire for relationship. So, that message, of course, that's what this whole class is about, that message. So the friend of the bridegroom, they are locked into that message. Some sing it, some pray it, some make disciples with it, some preach it, some write it, some dance it, some skits and drama and media it, some paint it. They, there's so many ways to make it known. But there's another thing that's very significant about the friend of the bridegroom spirit. It's not just, I mean, not just the friend of the bridegroom calling. It's not just the messaging. It's the spirit. Because John, the spirit of the friend of the bridegroom, he doesn't draw attention to himself. It's very important to John that when the people hear him, they're not going, wow, John. They're thinking they're captured by another. And today, across the body of Christ, there's so much pulpit and music entertainment, even in the body of Christ, drawing people to the big personalities of, and the skills and wowing people with their oratory and their knowledge and their abilities and their vocal abilities. And wow, you're amazing. And, and the Holy Spirit saying, I'm raising up a different spirit. I'm raising up a spirit upon my messengers that are not drawing attention to themselves. They're actually very specific about a message and about a spirit in which they give it so that the people 
They're jealous like the father is that the people are captured with the bridegroom, not their oratory, not how smart, how fast they are, how big their influence is, how good their voice is, how great their skills are, how great this, that, whatever, whatever, whatever. Because it's human nature to want to show that. But there's a different spirit God's raising up, and John the Baptist was the first one to really uh, establish that. And I just love this. I look like a Lord, let this be in our community more and more the friend of the bridegroom spirit. Top of page two. And, uh, and I hope to spend a whole session because there's a lot on this subject and there's a number of more verses that need to be brought in to understand this passage more fully. But it's all about the bridegroom message. So uh, the friend of the bridegroom spirit is. Top of page two. Now, Jesus is going to mention the bridegroom on three different occasions. And I think the progression is important, meaning it, none of this is accidental. I mean, imagine how important this is. This is the bridegroom God, Jesus. He's up in heaven before he, the incarnation, before he became a man. And this is my uh, imagination. He's listening to Hosea. Hosea, we looked at it last week, Hosea 2, verse 16, he said, In that day you will say of the Lord, you are my husband. I can imagine Jesus. Again, my uh, imagination, he's going, Father, what a day that will be when they say that to me with understanding. And then Isaiah, just a couple years, uh, they were contemporaries, Hosea and Isaiah, but Hosea's a little bit older, started a little bit earlier. Now, Isaiah says it too a couple times. And Jesus, I'm just imagining his heart beats and he's, oh Lord, I mean, that's my language. Father, with my own lips, I will say this. So now he's on the earth. He's at the wedding at Cain of Galilee. We looked at John 2. He doesn't say anything. He's like, Ugh. she walks down that aisle and he goes, Father. And Father says, you can start now, do miracles. But that's it for now. And he's going, yes. Yeah. So he hasn't actually said it with his mouth. But there's only three times recorded in the scripture, which means, that, you know, the scripture's the eternal. This is the three records of his words related to this most glorious subject. We'll have this record forever. These three will be there, and only these three. So each one of them, though at a casual read, you might think, oh, it's kind of cool. The Lord says, no, those are my three of my big moments. Those are not small. All three of them are really big to me. They were strategic. They were calculated. They were at the right time and the right nuance. So I look at these three statements, and I just imagine Jesus, he cherishes these statements. And undoubtedly, he knew what he would say, when he would say, long before he said it. And I'm just imagining him filled with love, waiting, waiting, waiting. And so here it is. First, I give the summary here in paragraph eight. First, he declares he's a bridegroom. We'll see that in a moment. Meaning he gives his own identity. And then he declares that his leaders are friends of the bridegroom like John. So his first statement is a statement of identity of who he is and who his people are who are partnering with him. Then later, the next time he mentions it, it's a parable. It's the nature of the kingdom. Not the identity of Jesus and his leadership or his messengers, but now it's the nature of the kingdom. It's like a wedding. My father has prepared and arranged in a wedding. That's what the kingdom is all about. And then third, he talks about the quality of the relationship of his people. They have to get oil like those interacting with the bridegroom, the bride and the bridegroom. They have to get oil. So the first statement is about his identity and the identity of his servants. The second is the nature of the kingdom. It's like a wedding being arranged. And thirdly, it's the quality of the relationship of all the people of God. If they don't get oil, if they don't stay in the interaction, if they don't cultivate the interaction, is a better way to say it, then they're going to miss out on what God has for them because this isn't just about hard work and greater influence. It's about interacting with the bridegroom, and it's called oil in that parable. Well, let's look at the first example, paragraph B where Jesus, he declares his identity. Now, this is about a year after John does it. 
I mean, this is a long time. Jesus has waited one year. It's just about almost real close to exactly a year. It's at the Passover again, but now it's AD 27, uh, 28, and he's up in Capernaum, up in Galilee, up north. Paragraph uh, in verse uh, Matthew 9, verse 14. Here it is again. John's disciples are in another argument. I mean, these guys were feisty, but they just had some issues. They got a guy to settle down a little bit. And you're supposed to be learning, not more confronting at this stage of the game. And so this time, they're challenging Jesus. Okay, well, I love it, and I think Jesus loved it. They said, same group, probably. You know, John didn't have millions of disciples. It could be the same very group. You know, they're up north, uh, up in Galilee area in Capernaum, and, they're, uh, and they go to Jesus, and they say, hey, we got a question. We fast. Our guy, John, we do, this, we do that intense stuff. Jesus says, well, that, that's good. They have no idea who he is, not really. They've heard John point at him, but they're, they're talking to him as though they don't really get who he is, because you would never say that to him. And they said, and the Pharisees fast. But here's the problem. Your guys don't fast. You're a good teacher, Jesus. I mean, when we hear you, we're like, wow, that's really good but you're not really producing much dedication in your people. Jesus is smiling. Again, this is my imagination. Going, okay, I like your heart. He goes, our guy produced dedication. You don't so much, but boy, you're interesting, and your miracles are amazing. Why don't you call them all the way in? And Jesus said, okay, verse 15. He goes, let me give you, ask you a question. Can... The friends of the bridegroom, can they be sad? Can they mourn when they're in the celebration in the very presence of the bridegroom? And the answer is no. If you're, if you're the friend of the bridegroom and you're with the bridegroom, that's not the time to fast. That's the time to feast. You're with him. They're going, okay. So what's that mean? Wait, the friend of the bridegroom is our guy. That's John the Baptist. Remember a year ago in John 3? He's the friend of the bridegroom. Jesus says, well, there's a whole group coming up that are friends of the bridegroom. You know, some of the apostles are there. They go, is that us? We didn't know we were. So he's actually identifying them too. And they're going, he's actually setting the trajectory of how they're to interpret ministry and the spirit they're to operate in. He goes, no, the question, the answer is no. You can't mourn when you're in the presence of the bridegroom you love, but, but the days are coming. Very cryptic again. The days are coming. He'll be taken away. Now the, the, the disciples of John are, are kind of listening, but the, the disciples of Jesus are going, take an away? You know, what meaneth thou this? Taken away? This is the first hint of his death. And he goes, yeah, there's a coming a day. This is long before he talks directly about the cross, the crucifixion, his death, and resurrection. This is early days. He goes, I'm going to be taken away one day. And I, I can imagine Peter, James, and John and the guys going, what does that mean? But then here's what Jesus told the disciples of John the Baptist. He goes, let me tell you, when I'm gone, which that troubled Jesus' disciples, my guys will fast because they will long for the experience of the presence they have when I'm with them. That when I'm physically gone, though my spirit's with them, when they fast and longing to encounter me in a greater way, he goes, they will fast. But not right now, but they will through their days afterwards. And that's why we call this the bridegroom fast because it's a fast that that uh, accelerates and increases our capacity to encounter the bridegroom. It's not a fast that earns anything, but it's a fast that positions us to see more and to feel deeper and our capacity to increase. It's a fast related to desire for encounter, not just for revival or for safety or for a miracle, but it's a fast connected to encounter. Okay, so, but in this statement, you've got a paragraph one. He says, as long as the bridegroom is with them, they might have missed it. But this is the first time in human history, in the Bible, 
the bridegroom himself refers to himself. He doesn't say, I'm the bridegroom, but he's talking about the Messiah himself. He goes, the bridegroom, me, I am that man. I am the one John mentioned in John 3 a year ago. I am that man with a heart. I am the fulfillment of what Hosea and Amos and Jeremiah said. Okay, paragraph C. <clears throat> so now, that was Jesus' first mention of the bridegroom. Now there's two more mentions. Now it's interesting that Jesus waits till the very end of his ministry, till the very final week to mention himself as a bridegroom again, and he does it twice in one week. One time in Matthew 9, and then a couple years later, there he says it again. And it's like, and I, I love to just ponder on this and say, Lord, what were you, why the wait? What was happening in your heart? I mean, these three big statements, they were they were big to him, and they were dear to him. They were not like a small and, and unimportant. So it's these two parables that he gives. And both of them <clears throat> are in the final week of his ministry. Now notice, one of them is his final public sermon. It's the final message Jesus gives to Israel and the whole human race. Now, if you had one more message, and you're the Messiah, to give the nation of Israel and the whole human race his public message, what would it be? Well, paragraph D, we find out what it is. He says, he stands there, I can imagine, Israel's before him. He knows the cross is in a couple days. He's waited these three and a half years of ministry. He's mentioned it once up in Galilee. Now he's in Jerusalem. And I just picture him standing and going, Father, can I say in Jerusalem what Isaiah said about me in Jerusalem? I haven't said it in Jerusalem, just up in Capernaum. Can I say it here? The Father says, oh, I got a couple of days. The Father says, yes. Again, this is my imagination, that conversation. And Jesus, I just picture him closing his eyes and saying, the kingdom of heaven it's like a king, my father, he's arranging a wedding for his son. And they're going like, boy, that's intense. And he goes and he's raised up messengers. And they're going out. And what is the definition of the messengers? They're calling people to a wedding. They're more than calling them to escape hell, which is a good call. They're more than calling them to have a life purpose. Like, I want to give my life to Jesus so I have something to do that seems important. I like that too. I like things that are important in my life. There's a bigger story. The messengers are calling the nations to a wedding. There's a wedding that nobody understands and the preparations are unfolding and they will for the next 2,000 years, but it's just a day, it's just two days to the Lord. A day is like a thousand years. In a minute, that wedding will be before us. It's interesting, paragraph E, well, more than interesting, it's significant, that right after he gives his final public message, which is the kingdom is like a wedding. He's never given this before. He, has, he saved the best for last. He saved this message for the last. Just like that wine at the wedding, just like the Holy Spirit is gonna focus on the bride and bridegroom at the very end of natural history. Even the Spirit saves the best for last. Well, Jesus gave the parable in paragraph D, but now in E. It's only a minute later. Well, you know, a minute and a half. And then he makes the grand declaration. You shall love the Lord your God. He declares it over Israel. He wasn't only giving an exhortation, you should love him. He was doing that. He was giving a prophecy, you will love him. He was actually quoting Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, when God told Moses that at the end of the age, in the generation of the Lord returns, Israel will love the Lord. Not should, they will. It's a prophecy. So Jesus is standing there before the nation he knows he's, this is his last time ever to be there in the natural. He gives the parable of the wedding, 
And then he prophesies, you shall love the Lord your God. Now his ministry to them is over, his public ministry. Then he goes over to the side and he gives the final warning to the Pharisees. He goes, your house is desolate because you have completely rejected me and that's it. But his, his public message to the masses is over with the, the declaration, you shall love the Lord your God. Paragraph F. Now he's, the next day or so, he's in the side, I mean at the side, he's just with his disciples, he's in private is what I'm trying to say, not a public meeting. And uh, he talks to his disciples. He goes, now you guys know there's a wedding being planned, right? They go, yeah, yeah, we're, we're getting it. You understand, you're friends of the bridegroom. I told you that a couple years ago. Okay, but you have to understand this. Oh, my beloved friends of the bridegroom, that you got the message clear, and I think you have the right spirit. You're not about drawing the people to you, but you have to sustain the relationship with me or it won't work. So now he tells them, Matthew chapter 25, he goes, the kingdom of God isn't just like a marriage, a wedding. The kingdom of God is also like the individual servants of the Lord have to cultivate and sustain an interaction with my heart. I don't mean every minute, every day, but they have to constantly be intentional about oil in their heart. And he's talking to the 12 about the 12, about being friends of the bridegroom. And he breaks it down real simple. He said, the servants of my kingdom will be like 10 virgins. Now in the, and we'll, hopefully we'll look at this in one of the sessions before this uh, course is over. I mean, there's so much on the bridegroom, we can't fit it all in in one course. But I mean, so much of the Bible on it. But I, I hope that we get to this in a more detailed way. But all of his servants, well, all of his all believers, they are made to be virgins in the Lord's sight by, the, by, the, by receiving the gift of righteousness. So they're all, they're all clean before the Lord and they're all servants of his. They all have lamps, notice verse one. They all have, they're bringing light to other people. They have a ministry. Number one, look at uh, verse one. They all have a introductory revelation of the bridegroom. They're going out to meet the bridegroom. They get it. They went to the bridegroom conference. They took the bridegroom class. They taught the bridegroom class. They sang bridegroom songs. They went out to meet him, meaning they are engaged in that introductory way. They get it. But what happened? Time went on. Five of them were foolish. They took their lamps, their light shining mechanism, their ministry, but they didn't, they didn't think about oil. Jesus said the other group, they took oil first and their lamps second. The very definition of wisdom, he's looking at the 12, if you make time for oil, you are called wise. If you run with your lamps and run out of oil, though I love you and you do love me, you are called foolish because you do understand who I am and you got too captured on your assignment and increasing your influence or making your impact and you forgot what it was about. It's first about my heart and your heart and my people and you can't impart what you don't have and you're out of oil. So he's giving this, these, again, these 12 apostles are going, okay, I think we got this. He goes, this is really important. You have to know Matthew 9, the identity. I'm the bridegroom, your friend's the bridegroom. You gotta know, Matthew 22, the nature of the kingdom. It is a wedding that's unfolding, but you have to know, Matthew 25, that the quality of the relationship of my servants must be maintained by getting oil. Again, I don't mean every minute, every day, but that must be more important to you than getting a bigger sphere of light for your lamp. Top of page three. Well, Jesus goes on in paragraph G, and I won't go into this, but the, the upper room discourse, the Matthew 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, it's when he washes their feet and he talks to them. He unfolds, he doesn't say bride and bridegroom, but the theme is the intensity of his heart for them. 
So it's bridegroom themes without using the term bridegroom. But the upper room, because they're in the upper room, discourse or sermon or teaching or conversation, it is very bridegroom, bridal paradigm uh, oriented because it's about his intensity of how he feels towards them. In paragraph H, now he goes and uh, it, this, his, his uh, discussion with them is over. And now he enters into that prayer, that famous John 17 prayer where it's Jesus and the Father. This is the longest conversation of Jesus and the Father in the whole Bible, John 17. And it gives us insight into his heart. I mean specific. But it's that prayer, and I don't want to go through it all, but it has many bridegroom themes and heart desires and bridal perspective dimensions to it. I mean, we, I guess we'll look at verse 24. We look at this every week, but it deserves to be looked at every week. He says, Father, here he's about to go to the cross, the agony of the cross. He goes, I know the cross is going to be very, very difficult, but I desire her. She's on my mind right now. I just can't imagine anything more dear than this. I want her to be with me. This is about my eternal companion forever. This is the part of the joy that is set before me when I'm enduring the cross, is knowing she will be with me. Then he goes, they're going to experience his glory. And he prays her. He goes, Father, I'm going to declare your name to her. I believe that Jesus' favorite ministry to his bride is declaring the Father to the bride. He goes, I want to tell you what he's like. And that's what he does by the Holy Spirit. He wants, to, he wants us to know the Father. And, and that's, I believe, one of his, I, you can't say f the favorite, but it's certainly the favorite. Okay. <laughs> and then he ends it with, Father, the love that you are filled with for me, impart it to her. Impart your supernatural love in her. Beloved, this is a bride of Christ prayer. I mean, this is amazing prayer. John 17, verse 26. Okay, paragraph I. Well, 60 years go by, plus or minus a few years. No one knows exactly. And it's now the book of Revelation. Jesus appears on the island of Patmos 60 years later after the resurrection. Again, 60 is a ballpark number. And he has one more message for the church. He's saying, well, John, here he is, you know, eyes of fire. John falls before him like a dead man. He goes, John, don't be afraid, it's me. John, get up, it's me. John's trembling and shaking. I've never seen you this way, Jesus. He goes, John, there's many things you don't know about me, but I love you. I want you to go tell the church. I got another message. So it's Revelation 2 and 3. There's seven churches, you know that, but he starts off. It's how he begins the message and ends the message uh, in these two chapters that I want to point out. And of course, there's, you could develop many points. He says, first, I want you to tell them, Revelation 2, 4, go tell them, they don't love me like they used to. This is the church at Ephesus, Revelation 2, 4. Now, you know, Ephesus was the greatest revival, actually, the book of Acts. It far surpassed the numbers of Jerusalem, Acts 19 and 20. You just, you want to get a little bit familiar with Ephesus, you know, the book of Ephesians. Ephesus, that's the place Paul spent more than any other place, three full years there. He said, all of Asia heard the word of God out of Ephesus, the most powerful uh, revival in the book of Acts. Well, it's some decades later after Paul's died, it's probably three decades after Paul's died. Jesus appears. And he says, John. John's an aged man in his 90s. Go tell them they don't love me like they used to. They've lost their love for me. They're busy. They're as busy as can be. They're shining their lamp everywhere. But remember, if they lose the oil, this is, they've lost the idea of why I called them. Go tell them I want them to love me. Then he speaks to the next five churches. Very important messages, obviously. And then he now comes to the church of Laodicea. And now we know the church of Laodicea gets the greatest rebuke of the seven. I mean, he really rebukes them. 
you think you're hot or you're cold or whatever, whatever. He says, you're lukewarm. You're absolutely lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. He actually said, you think you're rich and you think you have need of nothing and you're wealthy, but actually you're not hot or cold. You don't know. You're completely out of touch with me. So he, get, he gives them the greatest rebuke. But listen, this is remarkable. To the group, he gave the greatest rebuke. Verse 20, he gives the greatest promise. He says, you need to repent, but you know what? If you do, you'll dine with me. We'll have banquets together. You'll reign with me. We'll eat and reign together forever. But you gotta repent though. So the church that gets the biggest rebuke gets the biggest promise. So he begins and ends this message talking like a bridegroom. You don't love me, return. Then he tells the other group, if you will return, we'll reign together forever in the celebration of love. Well, that's the ministry of John and Jesus. We'll just take the next couple minutes. We won't go real long on this, but just a few more little bullet points. Paul the apostle, he addressed, he makes mention of the bridegroom reality on two different, in two different passages in a very direct way. Now, he never uses the term bride, which is interesting. Jesus and John talk about the bridegroom, and John mentions the bride one time. He that has the bride uh, is the bridegroom, that one reference. But Paul doesn't actually use the term bride, but he describes the cherished bride. And we looked at Ephesians 5 a couple times, so I won't go into uh, spend time on that. But the point of it is that the victorious church, the glorious church, is going to have the defilement and the compromise washed off of her spirit by the word of Jesus cherishing her. He says, I'm going to wash the church with the water of the word. I mean, Paul says Jesus is going to. But particularly in verse 29, it's the word about Jesus cherishing his people. That is going to wash defilement, accusation. It's going to break the power of lust, despair, depression. When they feel cherished, when they're washed of all these wrong emotions, they will walk so differently in this bridal reality. Then in paragraph C, and again, I hope that we take a, 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 a whole uh, period of time on this in one of the other sessions, that uh, 2 Corinthians 11, Paul talks about, well, 2 Corinthians 10 and 11, those two chapters go together. I don't think I have that. Yeah, yeah, I do. In the, there it is. So uh, chapter 10 and chapter 11 go together. And uh, it's about spiritual warfare and breaking strongholds of the mind. And Paul says, I'm going to give you the summary right now and develop at another time. Paul says, you're going to break the strongholds of your mind and other strongholds as well by specifically by engaging with these two truths. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. That you are betrothed to the Lord and that you are a chaste virgin. He goes, and again, we'll break this down at another time. If you know you're betrothed, to the Lord. That's that famous verse in, in uh, uh, Hosea chapter 2, verse 19. We looked at last week where three times the Lord says, I am betrothed to you. I am betrothed to you. I have made binding commitments to give my heart to you forever. It's a legal, permanent, full binding of my heart. I am betrothed to you. Paul's saying, if you know you're betrothed. And number two, you know you're a, a chaste virgin, meaning... Everything that you've done, the Lord says, I've forgiven you. I've cleansed you. If you will say yes to my leadership in an ongoing way, my grace is sufficient. Beloved, here's what I've learned as a pastor. If people feel clean, they live clean. But when sincere believers, which is very, very common, are way down with their overwhelming pain of the failure and despair and accusation and all of these, these overcoming uh, uh, feelings, that lust and even greater sin is energized by, by despair. I mean, there, there's folks out there in the body of Christ sinning because they like different things, but they're also sinning because they're under the weight of despair. 
And when a person is in despair, they go, you know what, I'm in so much pain for failing God, and I love God so much, I have no hope of ever recovering. I'm, I'm done, and, but I love him, but I'm in so much pain, I'd rather just go do this and that and escape a little bit, because I'm done anyway. That's the biggest lie. And Paul says, do you know you're betrothed? And you are a chaste virgin. He's talking to the most carnal church in the book, in the, in the New Testament. The Corinthians, well, the Laodiceans would rival them for it. The Corinthians and the Laodiceans, he goes, hey, don't go there. If you know who you are before him, you could break the power of despair. You feel clean, you live clean. You, you have a total different trajectory if you know you're betrothed and you're chaste in his sight. You all stand up with courage and energy to go, if he feels that way about me, I don't want immorality and drunkenness and, and laziness. If he really, he feels this way, I'm yours all the way. And Paul knows the power of this truth to break strongholds of the mind. Top of page four. Well, now we're at the book of Revelation. And I, we already talked about Jesus in Revelation 2 and 3, his message to the churches, so we'll skip that. We're at the very end. Now, here it is. Revelation 19 to 22, the last four chapters. The first two chapters of the Bible, Adam and Eve, a bride and a bridegroom in a garden of, in a paradise. The last four chapters, a bride and a bridegroom in a paradise, in a garden together. The bookends of natural human history and the story in between is the Father's leadership wooing people to see and to respond to this message and not to just cast it aside. So here it is on the last day. Let us be glad and rejoice. They see the marriage and they'll be the gladdest, most ultimate human joy imaginable and there will be I guess several billion, I mean, I don't know the number, multitudes will be there. And it's the, it's the ultimate of human joy. Here's the good news. It's sure to come. It's sure to come. You're going to be there. It's sure to come. Ultimate joy in your life forever is absolutely sure. Absolutely sure. So we get a sneak peek of how we are going to feel on that day right here. Not just the multitude. You put your name in this verse. I see there, and let Mike be glad and rejoice. Blessed is Mike. He is called to the Whoa, this is awesome. Make this personal. But don't do what John did, verse 10. John was so overwhelmed that this multitudes in the fullness of supernatural joy, and that's the joy forever. John, I mean, John's like, the deepest guy of the, all the apostles. I mean, he's in his 90s. All the others had been martyred many years before. I mean, John, you laid your head on the Lord's breast. You're like, you're really close to the Lord. He falls down and worships an angel like inconceivable. You know, that new guy, maybe he doesn't get it. And, you know, we shake him up, you know, wake him up and say, hey, don't ever worship an angel. John, what are you doing? This angel says, John, 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 I know you're really overcome right now. No, this is not good. Das ist nicht gut. You can't do this. <laughs> this is not okay, John. This is not okay at all. And John's overcome is, and I think, my goodness. And one of the reasons John's overcome, because this is personal to him. This is not a theological statement. John sees it. He sees the joy of the human race, but he sees this is where it is. Oh my God, this is it. This is more than I could have dreamed of. And he's overcome because it's personal. It's not just a theology lesson. It's not just a class. It's not a conference. It's not a song. It's real. He falls down. Well, paragraph one, it gets worse. The angel then shows John the new Jerusalem for a chapter and a half, the bridal city. Now, the new Jerusalem is called the bride, and some people get confused by that. They go, I thought the people were the bride. Is the city the bride or the people the bride? I go, stop, you're both right. Because the city was tailor-made for the people. Jesus said, I'm gonna go prepare a place for you. 
The city was designed for the bride. The beauty, the fragrance, the songs, and everything the bride touches in the city. This is my theory, but I think it's right. They drink the water, and they, they're awakened in love. They eat the fruit. Oh, they hear the music. They smell the, they fellowship. Everything energizes them with love throughout the city. So the city was tailor-made for them. The city is for them. Everything in the city energizes them in love. The city is called the bride, and the people in the city are called the bride because they're dynamically connected forever by the Lord's wisdom. So John sees the glory. And at the end of that, paragraph 1, chapter 22, John, Eve worshiped the angel again. John, you can't worship angels. You know a million times more than I. You can't worship an angel. John gets up and goes, oh, that's bad, but I'm so excited right now. That's not okay, John. Bible, we do Bible, okay? But he's so overcome because it's, again, it's not a story to him, it's real. Well then, paragraph C, the final, the great, the final, look at paragraph C, three at the very end. Lean with that sentence, worship team, come on up. The final prayer, the final emphasis of the spirit, the final prophecy in the word is that the spirit would be anointing the church in her bridal mandate and identity. That's the number of final emphasis. It's, I'm imagining the Spirit is saying, I saved the best wine for last. For 2,000 years of church history, it's been true, but the Spirit has never universally emphasized this, church, this truth across the body of Christ. But John is prophesying the Spirit <clears throat> is going to universally emphasize the Spirit saved the best wine for last. So in the Canaan of Galilee wedding, Jesus Save the best line for the last. He goes, I, I mean, this is my thought. This is a prophetic statement. I don't just begin my ministry here. I'm saving the best for last. Then the end of his ministry, he doesn't hardly ever talk about being a bridegroom. Then he lays it out, his final week, the bridegroom. Then church history unfolds, and John sees the final revelation. It's the bride and bridegroom. Beloved, this is not a truth that is just like, well, I'm not really into the bride thing. This is way bigger than I'm not or I am into the bride thing. This is about Jesus. This is about you. This is about the Father's plan. And this is the, when I see this, I want to make sure I'm getting oil. You know, and someone's mad, and someone's glad, and someone's sad, and the money didn't come, and my body doesn't feel good, and she said something bad, and they kicked me out. And Beloved, let me tell you, there's a bigger storyline than all of the obstacles that people feel. There's a big storyline, and we need to get connected. And Because if we do get connected, then we lose it. I do. Then I reconnect. It's called getting oil. I lose it. Then I reconnect over and over and over again. Amen and amen. Let's stand. <laughs>